Welcome to Meteor Interviews, a series of interviews with Meteor developers. My name is Paul Downey. This podcast is produced by OKGrow. OK we build web and mobile apps for clients using Meteor. You can find us at okgrow.com. Today I'm speaking with Ben Green. You may know him as Numtel on Atmosphere and GitHub, where he has many packages and open source projects. Ben's working, is working on working on working on bring bases to Meteor. He has written packages for MySQL and most and Postgres already. And he's currently on an epic cycling trip through California, so I'm glad he could take the time to talk with me. Welcome, Ben. Hey, how's it going? Great. So today I want to learn about the state of using SQL with Meteor and the technical challenges that are involved in getting SQL support up to par with Mongo. But first, where are you headed on your trip and where did you start? <laughs> um, I started, I guess, two weeks ago now in uh, Santa Cruz, just south of San Francisco, and ended up down in Los Angeles, um, I guess, two days ago now, and i um, going to continue down to the border and meet a friend and cross over into Baja in a couple weeks and see awesome. how much fun it is down there, see if I want to keep going. Awesome. That sounds amazing. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. So, Absolutely. So what made you start working on SQL support for Meteor? It seems like a pretty ambitious thing to tackle. Um, I'd gotten into Meteor, I guess, last end of August, beginning of September. Started going to the dev shops and ended up going to a different meetup at the Compose headquarters for RethinkDB. Um, Slava Kim, Meteor core developer, was there giving a talk, talking about how Meteor works with real-time data. And I was talking to him before the presentation and kind of asked him what he thought a really cool feature that Meteor doesn't have yet that could be implemented. And he told me that SQL support would be huge. And yeah. kind of from there, I started working on a project on my own. Awesome. Yeah, it, it, it is huge. So it's the most voted on card by a long way on the Meteor Roadmap Trello board. So yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> whoever makes that work is going to be a hero. Um, so Postgres seems to be your focus right now. What have you built so far? Um, with Postgres, I've got a package for Meteor that connects to a Node.js package and it will provide reactive result sets. So basically, you perform a query and you can subscribe to a publication that gives you an array of data from the database. And you don't have, so it doesn't have a client side database. You just get the result sets for each query individually, but you get mm -hmm. them reactively as the data changes. Very cool. And so, so, and you had also built something similar for, uh, for MySQL. Um, mm -hmm. and your, and so your MySQL also, your, your MySQL package also includes uh, a bit of nice stuff for development, like, um, like starting up a MySQL server. So are you, um, yeah. you working on that for Postgres at some point? Oh, it already exists for Postgres. Oh, awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely awesome. It's uh, called numtel colon pg dash server is the Meteor package. Um, nice. Both of those, the MySQL and the Postgres versions, they work on Linux, 32-bit, 64-bit, and 64-bit Mac. But I have not written the Windows support yet. So if anybody wants to do the Windows support, if they're a diehard Windows person, they can do that. But Windows, you get the easy installer, so it may not be near as much of a problem. Cool. So you didn't. You mentioned that it doesn't provide client-side SQL support yet. So there's no equivalent of Mini Mongo. So uh, what are the challenges in in getting that to work, or what will they be? And and um, and also I noticed that there is another project, this, the Space Elephant project, and they've done something similar. So maybe you can maybe you can tell us a bit about that as well, or what's yeah what's, um, what the, what they're doing Space differently. Space Elephant does try and provide client-side latency compensation by doing a client-side SQL engine using a la SQL, which mm -hmm. is made by Alexander Gershwin. Um, and it is a very difficult project. When you've got data sets where you're, or when you've got queries that are joining different data sets, then you have to deal with issues where you're going to have 
queries that might not necessarily have all the data cached on the client. And so if you've got something that joins like a one-to-many relationship where you've got, say, products that have a column that references a foreign key that has like a product quality, then you're going to have one row referenced multiple times and figuring out which rows to send to each client and making it so that the latency compensation actually works without making round trips to the server is it's a lot of logic to figure out and not something that I have attempted in my project so far because as soon as you get into those joins, you have so many different cases where things just are not one level of data. So it, it takes multiple trips to for your application server to the database server. And also then if you were making, say, a change to a record on the client, you'd have to go back and you wouldn't necessarily get instantaneous feedback on your client where you'd, okay. you'd have to wait. So um, why does the, the live query package, why is that not an issue for live query, but it is an issue when you start sending it to the client? I'm confused about that. So, so, you so your live query live package does like support live joins, right? Like I'm sorry. With Mongo. Sorry. Um, no, I mean like your, so your Meteor, I mean your uh, Postgres live query package does support joins, right? Yes. Okay. So I guess the difference is the data, like, okay. So I guess it's kind of the comparison between the Space Elephant Meteor Stream project and my project. My project will send the final result set. So you mm-hmm. get, it, it would be like having a Mongo collection or it's just a collection of JSON objects that match with every single column that has been returned from a query. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to do client-side latency compensation, you're going to be synchronizing rows between the client and the server. And that's what Meteor Stream does, the Space Elephant project. But figuring out which rows to send and making sure that you're not sending more columns than you're requesting, like how Mongo or how Meteor does with Mongo currently, where you don't, if you're only querying a few columns from a row or from a table, then you're not going to end up sending all these extra columns, which may contain data that you don't want the client to see or just data that's way too big to send to the client. Okay. And so, so you're talking about a case where the client is, is, is this only an issue when the client is, is changing data? Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Only when the client's changing data. Because, I, I mean, that's the whole latency compensation, right. optimistic UI. Right. Point. Okay. Okay. So, so if you were, okay, so getting the, getting your live query results back to the client and, you know, being able to do queries and things on the client, that would, that would not be the challenging part. But then the challenge comes in when you, when you start trying to do latency compensation. Did mm-hmm. I understand that correctly? Okay. Definitely. Okay, cool. So, okay, so so it does work with joins. Um, we covered that. So, is, is there anything that it doesn't support in terms of Postgres features? Or, well, that's uh, or, one of the benefits of using the approach where you just transmit the entire result set. Is you're able to use any Postgres feature. You're not relying on a JavaScript implementation of SQL. You're actually mm-hmm. running the full query in Postgres or MySQL. So you could install extensions Mm -hmm. and you could do whatever sort of any limitation, JSON functions, aggregate functions, all those you have no problem using. Okay, cool. So how how does the live updating work? So in the the Mongo driver uses, uh, the Mongo live query uses the op log, um, but uh, but how how does yours work? In my Postgres package, it ends up using what Postgres has a feature called notify and listen. And this feature enables you to send notifications from the server to the client. Whereas normally when you perform a query, it's kind of like doing a meteor method or remote procedure call where you you, you contact the server and the server sends back a response. But with notify and listen, 
you're kind of switching that around. So it's more like a publication subscription kind of thing where you say in your application, this is handled automatically by the package that you're going to listen for updates on a certain channel. And then anytime a query performs one of these notify commands, then the server will send a notification to listening clients. And so you'll get an asynchronous pack packet saying that a notification occurred on this channel and optionally a payload is included. And so in my Postgres package, the payload contains the like the inserted row on an insert or the new and old rows on an update or the old row on a delete. So mm -hmm. you're able to then validate that row and see if that row matches one of your queries using a manually specified Lambda function that you specify as you write your queries. Okay, cool. So and and so how how automatic is that? So when you're when you're using the package, do you 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 write a you you write a SQL query that you want to uh, you know have work with live updates, the, and so you need to write a, a custom invalidation function. Yeah, if you want it to work most efficiently, you definitely need to write these custom invalidation functions. If you decide not to write them, the package will automatically refresh the query on any change to the dependent table. So if you're get, grabbing, say, all the rows from one table, like in the Meteor leaderboard example, it's fine to do that because mm -hmm. any change to the table is going to change to your result set. But if you had, say, a table that contained information about every single one of your users and your query was just about one user, then you don't want to have it refresh every time something on some other user changes. And so you'd want to write that invalidation function to check to make sure that the row is actually matching that, okay. that specific user. Okay. So you'll write a function that says something like, you know, uh, you know, check, check if like the, you know, the, the name of the user or the ID of the user is matching this one. Otherwise don't, don't tell me about any changes. Yeah, exactly. You just return a Boolean true or false, whether or not to actually perform that refresh. Okay. And so, but that's optional just for performance. So you could get started playing around with it with something simple like the leaderboard without having to do that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Um, and so why not use Postgres's write ahead log, which is like, like the op log? Yeah, it would, there's, it would be awesome to do that. Um, that's that's kind of very similar to the way that my MySQL package reads the binary log. And I had looked into it. I was all excited about using the write-ahead log when I first saw the documentation. But the write-ahead log is almost an, an, a direct representation of the internal memory that Postgres uses. So you're not actually able to decode that data without having the exact same Postgres server running. Right. And it's not documented on their website for that reason. You can't, there's no direct translation without the entire application or the entire server application running. Okay. But Makes sense. Yeah, luckily in Postgres 9.4, which is the upcoming stable release version, there's a new feature called logical decoding which does do that, that translation, that decoding from the write ahead log to something that's easily readable. And okay. that has been implemented in my package yet. It, it would definitely be something that would be totally possible to implement and you'd even be able to make it so it was seamless for both approaches, the notify and listen or the logical decoding, except you would have a few more limitations where you'd have to, the user who basically initializes the live data coming out of Postgres would have to be what's called a super user. So you need elevated privileges to in, in, or instantiate that. Whereas with triggers and with notify and listen, you don't need any sort of special privileges beyond what's what a normal user would have. Okay, well, so given that and, and that you've already got it working with listen and notify, would there be any advantage at all in, in using the, uh, the write ahead log or would you just like why, why bother to, yeah. or why not just stick with what you've got now? It definitely it does work right now. Um, there is, there is one downside to the triggers and 
the oh, I guess it's not really a downside of the notify and listen, but the downside of the triggers is in order to add a trigger and remove triggers, it per, it locks the table. And so if you had a large system with many, many thousands of transactions per second, you might end up with cases where those locks would slow down your performance. And using the write ahead log, you could potentially have greater performance in these high load scenarios. But okay. really that that problem isn't huge because those triggers are only going to be installed when your application starts. So when you start your Meteor application, the first time a query is run against a table, it's going to install those triggers automatically and it's going to remove them when you exit the application. So if you say had like you were using a cluster setup where you had many Meteor application servers running at once, mm-hmm. then you might run into issues with locks but it's going to be in the higher scales. Okay, let me see if I've got this straight in my head. So uh, Postgres is listen and notify requires that you also add triggers on tables that you're that you're going to want to listen for queries on. Correct so far? Um, well, the triggers, I guess, I guess the triggers are how you know synchronously when data changes in a table. And then... So those triggers are written in Postgres SQL language, but in order to get a message from your Postgres SQL query in that trigger query out to your JavaScript application, then you put the notification in that trigger. So it's kind of like a, I guess those are connected, Okay. but yeah, you've got it mostly correct. Okay. So you need to use triggers and adding the trigger causes a lock on the whole table. So any other write operations on that table are going to be uh, affected. I, I guess reads will probably be fine, but if you're uh, if you're if you're doing other any writes, then it'll it'll briefly briefly cause you yeah, uh, uh, a, little, a little hold up with your writes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so what about transactions? I'm just thinking of of other other things that uh, and. And, and you know, actually, anything else that you that you that you think of that's like a SQL um, database standard thing that that Mongo doesn't have. Um, so let's start with let's start with transactions. Uh, yeah. What are the issues there? Well, the way transactions and notifications are handled, if you're using a transaction with multiple statements, the notification will not be sent to the client until the transaction completes successfully. So if you start Mm -hmm. a transaction and it ends up being rolled back, that notification will never get sent. So it's almost, it's almost automatically part of the way that the package works. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's intrinsic to using Postgres, which is awesome. You can use, which is, yeah, because you can't do that in Mongo. Um, yeah, that seems to be what you what you would want because you wouldn't want anyone else to be notified yeah, exactly. about your changes <laughs> until you commit the transaction. Okay. Well, then would you have a an unchanged notification or something? Yeah, <laughs> they wouldn't even be able to to read that data, I guess. So yeah. Um, what what else is what else is uh, different and unexpected about uh, or what else have I not thought of that w- that might be different? Um, I guess. I guess using joins is right. just, it gets really complicated very quickly when you get different types of joins. Um, it's really, it's really the problem of, well, I guess, I guess I'm looking at it for, for like the future when you're talking about, say, trying to get latency compensation on your mm-hmm. client. Mm-hmm. When you need to synchronize the rows, there's issues figuring out which rows correspond to which queries. And this is something that you'll encounter when you write your invalidation functions because you'll have to say, write a supporting query to figure out which IDs will match your general query. So if you've got something like I've got an example up on the on the wiki of the Postgres package repository, which has a query that selects. Um, it's kind of like a, a high school teacher's 
grade book example. And so they've got grades for each student for each assignment. And so the query selects all the scores for a certain class. So in order to figure out which assignments actually are related to that class, you have to run a supporting query. It only selects the assignments for that class. And then you are able to, in your invalidation function, specify against that data. So you've got two reactive queries in order to make the one general query that loads all the scores out. Mm -hmm. And these kind of things, if they were done automatically, then you'd be able to, like that's kind of the goal that you would need to have latency compensation on the client. It's it's just a different way of writing those invalidation functions for a different purpose. But it's still kind of the same problem of figuring out if you've got just knowledge that this one row has changed, then how does that row change my entire result set? Or is that something that isn't actually connected? Okay. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to check out that example now. Um, this is interesting. So, okay. So, so um, joins work basically aside from what you just mentioned and um, what other issues, what's, I, I mean, I guess what's the current, what's the, 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 what things need to be resolved before this is like at the level of say Mongo support right now? Well, I guess, I guess if you saw my, my dev shop presentation about a month ago, it from mm -hmm. the Meteor San Francisco Dev Shop. I did yep. a demo um, describing a memory leak problem, which thankfully I got fixed. Um, it was really, cool. it took me a while to figure it out. I ran a lot of load tests, made a lot of graphs, and eventually it all came down to the fact that I was using Babel's ECMAScript 6 to ES5 translator to use promises and generators and as soon as i pulled that out and just switched it back to run-of-the-mill callbacks all the memory problems went away <laughs> oh, so awesome. it was kind of like a face palm kind of thing but it's it's good to have that fixed and so so now that that stability issue is is lifted it's it's much better and it totally makes it usable it it scale and you can actually kind of understand how much memory it's going to use over time. Whereas before it was just, it would just climb and climb. And that's Excellent. kind of, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was so excited when I figured that out. <laughs> so, so is that, is the live query part, like, would you say it's production ready? So like performance and, and like, you know, obviously with that out of the way, is it, is it production ready performance wise? Well, the test I was running on my i3 Intel, laptop was a it was 50 live queries on kind of that same query with the student grade book scenario where you've got three tables joined together and I was running that 50 t queries with over a hundred transactions per second and getting response times of in the one to two second range so on cool. larger hardware on like a large AWS EC2 instance, I'm sure you're going to get much better times and be able to handle a much greater capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can use the load test application. I've got that. It, it's linked from the, from the repository and you could test that yourself to see how your server would match up to see if you're getting, if you're able to get the amount of throughput that you're looking for. Okay. So what about uh, authentication and the user accounts packages? Yes, the, the, the authentication user accounts is something that right now in Meteor is directly tied to Mongo. It stores all the user data in what's the user's collection. And so your application is freely able to put any kind of user-specific data in each user's document. Mm -hmm. And this is great for making applications quickly but it doesn't translate to SQL directly. There's, there's really no, well, it, with Postgres, you kind of do have a way to stick JSON into tables, but it's not direct 
you can't just make a user accounts package in SQL and be like, oh, look, it works. It's right. there. You're going to run into issues. And so kind of I've come up, I've been asked this multiple times, and I've kind of got three different possible future directions where this could take. Kind of a workaround right now that already exists is there's what's available for Postgres. It's called a foreign data wrapper. <clears throat> And this enables you to query other databases from inside Postgres. So you're able to install a MongoDB foreign data wrapper. And then you'd be able to use the default accounts package, storing your user account data in Mongo. And then if you wanted to say join to that data from Postgres, you can use this foreign data wrapper and use both databases at the same time, but getting the data out of Postgres. Okay, that's uh, so that that's Postgres specific, I guess, but it sounds pretty awesome. So you could actually literally do a, like a SQL join against uh, some of the the attributes in the in the user table on on Mongo. Yeah, it's a it's an extension that you can install on Postgres, and it's cool. if you search for it on Google, I'm sure you'll find it. Okay, so um, as awesome as that is, I mean that that is that is pretty cool to think about it technically, but. Um, but I guess, I guess it's probably doesn't sound like the, the like ultimate end all solution for like getting SQL working on, on Meteor. So that was your first option. You said you had three options. What else? Um, the second one would kind of be, and that's the reason why I've thought about it. You could basically make a kind of a Mongo simulator in Postgres because Postgres has the JSON data type, you could store JSON objects in a table in Postgres and basically treat it like a Mongo collection. And then you'd be able to run the user accounts package off of this basically simulated collection. And then you'd be able to have the data all in Postgres. But that solution doesn't really go i feel like it's it's kind of a band-aid and yeah, yeah it might be worth having just kind of a general package that does a kind of synchronization between mongo and postgres but really it seems like if you wanted to do this the most efficient way the the most straightforward way you would have just a re complete rewrite of the accounts package that stores data in relational database tables and yeah. hopefully it'd be possible to make it work agnostically with MySQL or Postgres SQL. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, through. I can't imagine that that would be too, I mean, I don't know, like <laughs> naively, I, I, I got to think that, that that must not be too complicated. Like I would imagine that you could just, uh, that just, I, I would, I'm assuming that somewhere in, inside the, um, the accounts packages that they're just, you know, doing Mongo queries and directly using Mongo. And do you think you would be able mm -hmm. to just kind of map that straight to like SQL, the SQL um, equivalent of it? Yeah, you, you definitely can. But I guess the issue that I see comes up is you're going to be breaking packages like how you've got, you've got the base accounts package, which does mm -hmm. some Mongo queries itself. And then you've got the packages that go up on top of that, like the Google accounts package, the Facebook accounts package, the Twitter accounts right. package, all these packages are potentially going to be speaking to your Mongo users collection. And so right. if you want to build a SQL based version of that, you're potentially going to have to rewrite all these accounts packages for these yep. different OAuth services. And they use nested or, objects. So they, yeah. use, they use sub documents. So you're going to, you're, you know, the, like this, the SQL way of doing that would probably you'd be joining to other tables, things like that. Or you could just flatten it all, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. It could go either way. You might have a table for OAuth information. Or you might have a table just for specific Google OAuth information. Right. Interesting. So, but I feel like that's that's what would need to be done to make SQL a, like really a first class uh, option for for developing with Meteor. I mean, I think if you mm -hmm. If you come from from the SQL world and you you don't want to use Mongo and you really want to use SQL, not just, I mean, I think we've got two use cases for this, and the first one would be that you're going to do media development with with Mongo, but you need to access, 
uh, data that that's in a relational database. And it sounds like you've got that pretty, like pretty well covered already. Like, I think that sounds like something that, that I would be comfortable using right now. But the, the second, the second like uh, person that might want to use this is somebody that is comfortable with SQL, doesn't want to use Mongo for whatever reason and wants to just do straight media development using SQL. So this, this sounds like, um, it sounds like for that use case that it would, it would need to be uh, kind of rewritten to, to be properly SQL. Do you think we're going to see that yeah. happen? Um, like, I do not personally have like future plans to write it myself, but I would love to see somebody write it or the media development group work to make their packages database agnostic. And there are some comments in there that's saying that it's going to get to it in the future. We'll see. Definitely with, especially with Slava Kim's Rethink DB progress, hopefully it's all coming in the future. So awesome. it's not something that is just pipe dreams, I guess. Well, that sounds like a good opportunity for someone to get involved with this project. Oh, definitely. Cool. Okay. So what's the future for, for your Postgres or for your Postgres support or for SQL in general? What are you going to, what are you going to do next? Um, I guess at this point, I, I am not going like, I guess I'm not really set in ready to jump in and start spending the months and months that I feel it would probably take me to write a system that would successfully do latency compensation on the client, mm -hmm. working with a client side SQL engine. I, I had mentioned in my last Postgres or in my dev shop talk last month that I was looking into the Google love field mm -hmm. and I spent a little bit more time looking into that. It is a, SQL engine or SQL like engine that lets you do queries in JavaScript in the browser. And it, it actually, you can actually make it work in node fairly simply just with a few modifications. And one of the things that was really awesome about it was it had observers or it has observers on the queries. So something that, you know, I spend all this time making work on Postgres and MySQL, it's just built into the SQL engine. Mm -hmm. but and I was I was really excited about if it was built in it must have some sort of logic that knows when exactly to refresh the queries or how to refresh them efficiently mm -hmm. but as I dug into it the the current implementation is fairly early in the development and it only it will refresh every query that's dependent on the table when anything on that table changes and even even if it was even if that was more elaborate and it was able to work into the query planner and figure out the most efficient times to refresh the queries the way that it performs the diff of the result set is fairly slow for long result sets so i was doing a test on I think I had a thousand rows in my record set and I would query that and then I'd insert one and so it would go from like a thousand to a thousand and one rows in the record set and just mm -hmm. for it to perform that difference would take two seconds per oh, wow. insert on my computer wow. and I looked at it for a little bit and I, I didn't see an immediate way to make that just orders of magnitude faster and so it kind of kind of let the steam out of my hope for that that method but it's that's not to say that latency compensation with sql is impossible it's just there's a lot of roadblocks and a lot of pro little projects along the way that are build up to something that could be a really amazing project cool. which definitely the meteor stream provides a little window into what that could be but it needs it needs a lot of work. So this this sounds like there's there's a lot that needs to happen still, but it's it's awesome that you're that you're like taking it so far. So w what do you think about official support? Like is is there going to be official support? Should there be even? So like some people are reluctant oh, to use something that that's not official, but um, you know, like if if the community just went and made this all work without 
without uh, the meteor development group's involvement at all. I mean, that to me, that sounds pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, it would be awesome. I mean, if, if the community is that strong and is truly able to do that, then absolutely. If there's that, I mean, you've got, it's the most voted on thing on the Trello board. If all those people who voted spend a little bit of time learning on how to make it actually happen would be amazing. I mean, Velocity is a community project and it's yeah. not, it's not a meteor core project, but there's, there's a handful of people that are getting together and are able to make it something that's important for themselves because they want to see it succeed. Yep. Whereas that the same thing could happen with SQL. Yep. Official and support would it, definitely help. Like they, they could hire you. <laughs> they could, <laughs> they, they have it, but, um, it, yeah, official support because then, you know, you know, somebody has time blocked out to work on it and support it when it's official, you know, that there's, there's people who are constantly mm -hmm. working on this. And, and that they're they, not going to release the next version uh, with something incompatible. Yeah. No, exactly. That's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, I mean, you know, community, communities doing stuff is really important. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, thanks for taking the time today. I've, I've learned a lot. So uh, is, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? Um, I think yeah. we covered mostly awesome. everything. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Cool. Thanks. So if our listeners would like to get in touch with you, how can they do that? GitHub page. I'm numtel, N-U-M-T-E-L. And that has my email address listed, which is ben at late night sketches.com. Um, send me an email or make an issue on one of my projects and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Looking forward to seeing where this goes next. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you liked this show, you can subscribe using iTunes or your favorite podcast app. For more info, visit MeteorInterviews.com. To learn more about OK Grow and the work we do, you can find us at OKGrow.com. Okay